is Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Graymoor, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, Do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy to be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. Saint Alfred. St. Elphidge was born in 954, and his parents were of the nobility. But at an early age, he abandoned the world to enter the monastery of Deerhurst at Glastonbury in southern England. He was named abbot of the Abbey of Bath, and later, Bishop of Winchester. In 1006, he was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury. During this period in English history, the people lived in constant fear of invasions by the Danes who sacked and pillaged. Though at times they were bought off by the payment of a form of international blackmail known as the Danegelt, which of course encouraged rather than discouraged further invasions. In the year 1011, southern England was especially vulnerable because it was governed by a weak king, Ethelred, who, for lack of decision, was called Ethelred the Unready. No change in the wind, Brother Cuthbert? No, Your Grace. It's still from the northeast. Blowing a full week from the northeast. No wonder the people are uneasy. And growing more so by day by day. I see the men in the field glancing over their shoulders toward the headlands. The days will come again. The only question is when... Perhaps King Ethelred will buy them off again as he did when Olaf invaded. Perhaps. But we gain nothing by paying tribute to stop their robbery. Still, Olaf kept his word. He did not invade. Yes, Olaf was a man of his word, Brother Cuthbert. But you can see what happens. He comes home laden with gold. And the men tell the story that it was given to them. They didn't have to fight for it. The word spreads. And one of his thanes organizes an expedition for England, where tribute can be had for the asking. It's a great pity the money that should be used for the public welfare is paid out in tribute to the Danes to keep them from our shores. It's happened so often, it's a custom. Think of it, Brother Cuthbert. Out of fear of attack, each little landowner and worker is taxed to pay this tribute. Still, if it gives us peace for a time... It doesn't. The collector of tributes never satisfied. If he doesn't come back for more himself, he sends another. Have you talked to King Ethelred about this? Yes, within the week. As usual, I got no definite answer as to what he will do when the Danes come. But he could gather an army. There's not a man in England who wouldn't rather fight the Danes than pay them tribute. It's always the same, Brother Cuthbert. These Danes of England, even though they be Christian at least in name, seem to prefer to fight each other than to unite against the common enemy. Brother Cuthbert. What is it, Your Grace? Look, to the headlands. Is that smoke? No. It's only mist driven from the marshes by the wind. <laughs> you see how, how fear grips us all alike. What do you mean, Your Grace? 
When they sight the Danes, they send up smoke signals. I watch that hill so constantly, I'm, I'm seeing signs that are not there. I'll keep the lookout for you, Thorkel. We should sight land soon. Why are the men stopped rowing? They're tired, and I wanted them rested when we land. When there's wind, the sail will be enough. You expect fighting, man. One never knows. It's best to expect it, and if it doesn't come, so much the better. But you told me the Saxons wouldn't fight, but would pay the tribute. Their King Ethelred paid it when I was with Olaf. He'll pay it again. What makes you so sure? If people invaded our homeland, we'd fight to the last man. Surely the Saxons resent paying the tribute. <laughs> Little good it'll do to resent it unless they have an army to back it up. Do you mean to say Ethelred hasn't an army? Well, he has, but so does his son-in-law, Edric. Ethelred doesn't trust him, and rightly so. Why do you say that? Ah, Thorkel, this is your first forage. You can't be expected to know the situation in England. But I wish you would tell me. This Edric was an alderman of the Mercians who lives to the north of Ethelred who gave him his daughter in marriage. And then helped him to become king of Mercia. He's greedy for power, and before this invasion started, our king reached an agreement with Edric. What kind of an agreement? Edric will join us against Ethelred and will march into Kent, while our ships will land in the Thames and plunder the land around Canterbury. Canterbury? Isn't that where the leader of the Christian religion lives? Uh, not exactly. The real head lives in Rome. This man in England is his thane and rules for him. He's called Archbishop. I'm anxious to see this man. Why, Thorgo? I'm told that Olaf was so taken with his religion that he adopted it. And when he returned to Norway, he had his people become Christian. That's true. However, I'm not interested in the Saxons' religion as much as I am in their gold. Look, off the port bow. What do you make of it? Smoke. Then it's the mainland. They've sighted us. They're sending the warning inland. Out oars! Row! Helmsman, steer for the smoke signal off the port bow! Your Grace. Brother Cuthbert, what is it? The beacon fires are burning. The Danes are sighted. The people know what to do. They're busy now driving their flocks inside the wall, gathering all available supplies. We'll be able to hold out for a long time. Will you see who it is, please? Archbishop Elfridge is here. You can leave a message with me. A message from King Ethelred. Let us pray he is marching his troops to Canterbury. What is it, bad news? Edric has revolted. He's in league with the Danes. He's already in battle with Ethelred's men. Then we're lost. The city walls are strong. We're well provisioned. We shall hold out. But for how long? For months. The Danes will find all the foods inside our walls. When their provisions are gone, they'll have to leave. They won't be able to break down the walls. <laughs> Brother Cuthbert! Brother Cuthbert! Here, here, coming, Your Grace. What was that crashing sound? Edric has delivered catapults to the Danes. His soldiers have shown them how to use them. They're battering down the walls. What news of King Ethelred? He's fled across the Channel to France. Your Grace, I've just talked to a group of town leaders in the anteroom. Yes? They think our situation's hopeless. They urge you to leave the city at once. Of course, you told them that I wouldn't. I took that liberty, Your Grace. But I told them I'd deliver your message. Look. The outer wall's crumbling. There falls the bell that's rung since St. Augustine brought Christianity to these shores. Alfred, Your Grace. 
I beg you, reconsider and leave. There are horses below. If you hurry... Brother Cuthbert, I am staying here. But they'll kill you if you stay. And God would disown me if I fled. Now that ends the matter. Yes, Your Grace. God save us. They've driven my people to the square. They're killing the animals. Brother Cuthbert, get me my vestments. No, no, Your Grace. It's certain death to go among them. My vestments at once. I must stop this slaughter. I beg you, don't go. They'll not listen. They're mad for blood. Then I'll turn their madness to me and away from my people. Swing that ball in his hand. See how the people kneel before him. Drum, it must be their man of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Look at the magnificent cloth and the jewel on his finger. Stop, who are you? I am Elphidge, Archbishop of Canterbury. Why do you come? To command you in the name of the Almighty God to stop this slaughter. <laughs> it is I, Thrum, who gives orders here. Then I beg of you, do not kill these innocent people. It pleases me to see them die. Why should I stop? Have you no fear of God's punishment? I fear nothing. Careful, Thrum. He carries a magic ball and may call down a curse on you. He's still talking. To the sword with them! Take that fellow over there! No. The Lord thy God commands it. Thou shalt not... Kill. I'll kill whomever I... Jane! His wrath will be upon you. Stand aside! No, no, Thrum. Don't bring a curse upon all of Let's us. Let go of my arm. What is your name? Thorkel the Tall. Thorkel the Tall. When you return to your homeland and assemble in the great hall to relate your deeds of valor and strength, what will you tell your comrades and your wives? Will you, Thorkel the Tall, boast of the manner in which you and your leader Thrum slayed first a child of twelve, then his mother who tried to save him? Will the hall ring with cheers for this mighty conquest? Or will old warriors with scars on their chest turn their faces from you in shame? Will you... The... Silence or I'll kill you. And will the cheers ring out for you, Thrum? When you tell how you killed the Archbishop of Canterbury, who came to you unarmed, except for the word of God, who ask you to spare his people. Silence, I command it. When God commands me to speak, I speak. Fool, you ask for death. Do what you like with me, but spare these poor innocent victims. Then die. Rom, no, wait. Come aside. I want to talk to you. What is it? Be quick. I don't think we should kill him. There's much more to be gained by not killing him. How? Oh. It's plain the people have great respect for him and will obey his command. Yes, so? If we demand tribute, he's the one who can tell the people to pay it. They'll pay or die. You can't rob a dead man unless you know where he's buried his gold. Warriors, take the holy man to prison. He'll stay in prison. If you want him released, deliver 3,000 golden crowns. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Hold. Enough. Now, Archbishop, will you command the people to pay three thousand crowns for your ransom? I've told you many times. I cannot burden the people to save myself. One word from you and they'd pay. The people are too poor to pay such a sum. Even if I should ask them. Don't speak to them. They'll find the money. You've already taken all they have. Well, tell them to dig for it. The Saxon always manages to hide something away. If their money's buried, it shall remain so. 
Archbishop, the people have respect for you. I pray God I do nothing to lose their respect. Surely they think you are worth the gold. I have taught my people that no man's life can ever be valued by gold. Three thousand crowns is little enough to ask for a man of your position. Why do you refuse? It doesn't come out of your pocket. You set far too high a value on my life. Well, what do you think would be a fair amount? When the Son of God was sold for 30 pieces of silver, what value can I or, or any man put on his life? Even a grain of sand would be too much. I don't understand all this. Will you or will you not ask your people to pay? No, I will not. Give him 40 lashes. Come, come, Archbishop. Get to your feet. I've learned of a way for you to get the 3,000 crowns without asking it of your people. I have no money. Oh, your church has plenty. All you have to do is unlock your treasure chest and take it out. Oh, that's not mine to give. You lie. The story is told that when you were Bishop of Winchester, you passed out money so freely that soon there were no beggars in the town. Oh, it was given to the poor, as my Lord directed. Then give it to me. No, I cannot. If you can give it to one man, why not another? From to the poor, the miserable, the hungry of this world, I can, I can give all that the church owns. Except what's necessary to sustain life, I, I can't take one penny for myself. Why, why, why? First you refuse to ask the people to pay, now you refuse to take it from your own treasury. The money you speak of is entrusted to me to do God's work. It can be used for no other purpose. Archbishop, I warn you. Before I sail, I'll either have 3,000 crowns, or you'll be dead. Elphidge, in spite of continued torture, refused to ask his people to raise money for his ransom. Sometime from stupefied with drink, would go to the cell in the middle of the night and question Elphidge, and then beat him and kick him until he was exhausted. This went on for some weeks. And then one day, two new visitors entered the cell. Elphid, your grace. Mm. Brother Cuthbert, how glad I have to know you're alive. Uh, who, who, who is this with you? I am Thorkel the Tall. Thorkel. Yes, I remember you. I didn't recognize you in the dim light. Tell him why we come. Your grace, many of the Danes have become ill with a mysterious disease. Nothing we can do cures it. Why come to me? I have no knowledge of medicine. Tell him to take away the curse he put on us. I've tried to explain to Thorkel there is no curse, but he'll not believe me. It was a curse. That day he came to the people, he had a silver ball which threw out magic water when he swung it about. Oh, it, it was not a curse, Thorkel. I was blessing my people as I prayed to God for their deliverance. This I told you many times, Thorkel. But you did not swing the ball among the Danes, and now many are dead. Your leader gave him no chance. He at once threatened to kill him. Isn't it true you give what your people call the bread of life? Where did you hear of this? From one of King Olaf's men, who was made Christian some years ago. It was I who confirmed Olaf in the year 994. As this man told the story on one of his voyages, Olaf's ships were wrecked far to the south on a small island. There was nothing worth stealing, and he spent much time in talking to a man who called himself Priest. And he told him why the cross is the sign of the Christian, of the man who was spiked to the cross, and why he had come into the world. The story so moved Olaf and his men that many of them wept like children and fell to their knees and asked for the water of life. It was then that Olaf was baptized. Later, I confirmed him. And did you give him this bread? 
It was given later. Then lift the curse. Give us this bread of life. But, Circle, I've told you, I'm not permitted to administer the bread to those who have not first been baptized and confirmed. Are we to die because you refuse this holy bread? Circle, go to your comrades and tell them that I have not put a curse on them. Tell them that I bless them, that I pray that they will be cured. Prayers? What are these prayers? A request one makes of God for help. Well, here, do you pray for your people? Oh, many hours each day. Then you must speak with God, because Thrum killed no more of your people. As he had promised Thorko, Elfridge prayed for the Danes. And a number of them asked to be baptized, so that they could partake of the holy bread. And many were cured of sickness. Elfidge was released from prison. And since the cathedral had been destroyed, he preached in the open air without hindrance from the Danes. Thrum again asked him to deliver 3,000 crowns, but did not press the matter when Elfidge refused. However, when the time came for Thrum to leave Canterbury, he took Elfidge with him. The ships were rowed up the Thames to London. But that city was too strong to attack, and the Danes landed at Greenwich, where they held a great feast before sailing for home. What's the matter, Thrum? Why so gloomy? What makes you say I'm gloomy? Outside, the men feast on oxen these three days. They're glad to be going home well laden with treasure, but you stay here in your tent and drink. I don't have the 3,000 crowns from the Saxon holy man. Even so, we have more treasure than any man ever brought back. I've talked to the older men, and they tell me so. I'll not be beaten by a Saxon, no matter who he is. But what will you do with him? Surely you'll not carry him back to Denmark. No. Why not release him and let him go back to his people? No. But if you'll not do one or the other, what... I swore by Wotan that he would either give me the money or die by sailing time. But the wind's shifting and we can set out by midday. What? I was not told the wind had changed. A message was sent, but you were so deep in wine, the man could not get it more than a grunt from you. He thought you understood. Come, there's no time to lose. Take me to the holy man. Thrum, what will you do to him? You'll see. <laughs> bones and each man pick one up. Elfidge, Archbishop, I give you one last chance. We're ready to sail. I promise to deliver 3,000 crowns and we'll stop at Canterbury long enough to pick it up and release you. If not, I'll stone you to death with ox bones. No, no, Thrum. He drove the plague from us. Your answer, Elfidge, be quick. My men are ready. From you must not. Which will it be, the gold or death? You give me no choice, sir. The gold. No. My death. Men? Throw! Give them what? Even Give those who struck and scourged you and spiked you to the cross. Stop! Stop! In the name of the Father and of the Son. Stop throwing! I'll finish this and of the whole. <coughs> And they stoned him with the bones of oxen. And Elfidge, Archbishop of Canterbury, returned to his god, a martyr. <laughs> <laughs> 